I'm John Kaiser at the Metals Investor Forum in Toronto, uh, March 3rd, 2023. I'm speaking with Bob Wares, founder and executive chairman of Brunswick Exploration. Bob, welcome to uh, Toronto. Thank you very much, John. Pleasure to be here. Bob, we were here nine months ago in June last year, mm -hmm. and your stock was 15 cents. I based my presentation on the idea that Lithium Mania 2.0 is coming. It's going to be a very big thing. Today, your stock is over a dollar. You have $16 million in the treasury. Mm -hmm. What has changed in terms of the reception you were getting in June of last year to this idea of looking for lithium in Canada to the reception you're getting today? Uh, well, the entire market's changed. Uh, first of all, there have been uh, two or three significant discoveries, uh, one of them being uh, in the James Bay region where we have a large land package, uh, PMET, everyone knows PMET. So that's really energized uh, the market and the Canadian scene. And uh, we spent the whole year acquiring ground and cutting option agreements and so on uh, to, to maximize our land uh, tenure in the James Bay. So that's obviously it's helped a lot. <clears throat> so uh, that's a that's combination of discovery, heating market and uh, growing our land positions such that now we have, uh, we went beyond Quebec. We've got ground in Ontario, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and where we were in all cases, we're entirely focused on acquiring um, either S-type pegmatites or in four cases, uh, mineralized pegmatites, LCTs. So that's giving us uh, instant drill targets. And uh, we have over 500 virgin outcropping pegmatites in our entire portfolio across the country now. So that's a, it's a huge inventory of pegmatites that have to be verified and analyzed uh, for their uh, lithium potential. So I think that approach of focusing uh, surgically on many parts of the Canadian Shield and acquiring pegmatite fields has been very well received by, uh, by the market. And to my knowledge, we're the only ones who have adopted uh, aggressively that strategy. Now you do have this uh, big market valuation because you have a multi-portfolio approach. Uh, you, you're not just like Patriot Battery Metals, which has a 55 kilometer strike land package uh, where there are multiple occurrences of what could turn out to be similar CV5 pegmatites, mm -hmm. you know, 50 Great to 100 potential. million yeah. ton deposits of somewhere between one, one and 2%. But early last year when you saw the lithium carbonate price up at $30, $35 a pound, a tenfold increase, and you grasp the implications of the uh, electric vehicle projections for 2030, mm -hmm. 600% expansion of current supply as outlined by the International Energy Agency. You thought, uh, 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 I probably missed the boat on this. And then you realized, no, you have no competition. So you have built this huge portfolio, mm -hmm. but Nine months later, there are lots of companies picking up stuff. How yep. has the competitive environment changed in terms of what's left for you still to sleuth out and keep building Brunswick's portfolio? Well, certainly certain regions uh, such as Ben James Bay, there's not a whole lot left. Uh, ditto for uh, Ontario now, it's, it's getting staked up, um, including Australian companies right now that have moved in very aggressively to take up huge land packages. But there are other parts of the Canadian Shield, which I won't mention, which are still relatively quiet and open, which we're working on. You have to realize that most world-class spodumene deposits are sitting uh, in shield areas, either Archean uh, protozoic, so basically Precambrian shields. And Canada has got by far the biggest Precambrian shield in the world. So ergo, the spodumene potential uh, in Canada is, is absolutely uh, outstanding compared to the rest of the world. There's absolutely no reason why we can't find another Manono or another green bushes in Canada. I think, uh, my opinion, it's just sitting there waiting to be discovered. The Corvette project was originally part of Virginia Gold Mines, uh, James Bay exploration mm -hmm. efforts. Uh, it was a target for orogenic gold. Virginia ended up being acquired by Osisco Gold Royalties mm -hmm. and Patriot Battery picked it up in about 2015 uh, for its lithium Lithium potential. potential. Mm -hmm. And you own the Plex project, which uh, is also 40, 50 kilometers of strike, comparable to the 55 kilometers 
a strike that they have. And, and Virginia drilled into something called the Orphe Gold mm -hmm. Target, uh, which wasn't turned out not to be big enough to be worth developing, but it passed through pegmatite along the way. Yep. And everybody's thinking, okay, pegmatite and orogenic gold deposits. Uh, what is the sort of relationship between the sort of greenstone orogenic belts that have been explored mm -hmm. in the past and the LCT type pegmatites? Yeah. Well, the, the pegmatites in the geological history of, of shield areas are tend to be much later than the orogenic gold deposits. Uh, but they also, a lot of them are also constrained by structure. So in the case of uh, Plex plus Corvette, you've got the Lagrange uh, shear zone, which is essentially uh, very close to the contact between the Lagrange greenstone belt and uh, what's called the uh, Lagiche group, which is metasedimentary. And the, um, the LCT pegmatites and associated S-type granites are generated during uh, melting of the sedimentary package. But the fault zone still encourages the injection of pegmatite dice because it's a crustal weakness zone. So in the case of Lagrange shear zone, yes, it's endowed with gold, but the pegmatites use the same fault structure to come up, you know, something like 50 or 100 million years later. So uh, you get the coincidence, the structural uh, superposition of two events which have nothing to do with each other, but they both borrow the same fault zone. So, uh, and in the standard model for uh, LCT pegmatite generation, you want to look at fault structures surrounding, you know, S-type granites. It's the ideal environment to, to generate those. If you look at the uh, frontier lithium discovery, that's in, in a very significant fault zone in uh, Northwest Ontario. And, you know, there are numerous examples of fault controlled uh, LCT dike injections late in the uh, orogenic history of, uh, of uh, uh, pre-Cambrian shield areas. Now, the, the boundaries between these different uh, domain provinces, such as La, 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 La Grande and uh, Opanaka, are those relevant to uh, potential uh, pigmentite emplacement? Uh, well, again, if you're a hardcore believer in the, the structural contacts between the greenstone belts and terrains like the Okanaga, or for example, uh, if you look at the southern Abitibi, um, you've got the Pontiac in contact with the Abitibi greenstone belt, and of course, that's the Cadillac break. And you've got the S-type granites in the Lacorn area, which generated a whole slew of pegmatites. You've got the Desel batholith in the Pontiac, Theoretically, the Cadillac fault should be full of pegmatite dikes, and we looked, <laughs> we didn't find any. <laughs> but that would have been, geologically speaking, an ideal area, an ideal setting for uh, for pegmatite ejection and potential uh, LCT mineralization. They ended up all clustering around the uh, Prasac Lacorn Bathlift just to the north. But quite frankly, I'm surprised there are no pegmatites in the Cadillac fault. Mm -hmm. there, there should have been given the amount of late tectonic uh, S-type granite activity, uh, both on, the, on both sides of the fault. So the, uh, the James Bay region, after you know, three decades of exploration, has not coughed up any significant base metal deposits. Eleanor is the only significant gold deposit, but even that one barely, barely makes it. Uh, so there seems to be this disappointment that the James Bay region doesn't have any real precious or base metal endowment, mm -hmm. but it does seem to have an unusual lithium endowment. Yes, it does. And I think uh, this is going to be the first great Canadian area play since the 90s when we had like Lac de Gras with diamonds and That's Boise, already happening. Boise's Bay. Mm -hmm. So we have all these companies swarming in there. You mentioned that there really aren't uh, isn't much room left to acquire anything meaningful in this area. Uh, retail hasn't quite figured it out. The, uh, the, the, the financial sector seems to have figured it out and you've been raising, mm -hmm. raising money quite effectively. But if we do get this mother of all great Canadian area plays, and I say mother because we're not just dealing with this recently recognized fertile district, but we're talking about a commodity that was worth $200 million in 2005 was worth 40 to 50 billion last year. And if the EV goals are to be met, will be a hundred to $200 mm -hmm. billion dollar a year market by, by 2030. This has never ever happened no, in, in metal history. So yeah. I expect a huge amount of money 
to pour into all these juniors from the bad to the excellent, such as Brunswick. And obviously the ones sticking out of the ground have been found, but not everything is sticking out of the ground. That's right. What methods of exploration will these companies have to do beyond you know checking to see if there's anything obvious sticking on the ground? And what is the potential that the either base or gold metals potential, a hidden endowment might yet be revealed for the James Bay region. So it isn't just a lithium district, but finally becomes a true gold mm. or base metals district. Well, uh, there's still lots of gold potential left. Uh, the James Bay area on the gold front has seen relatively little exploration compared to the Abitibi. And obviously there's still great uh, discoveries to be made in the Abitibi uh, on our front, you know, came Malartic windfall, uh, the, the book is still open and ditto for James May. Uh, base metals uh, would be less keen. Uh, the greenstone belts are small, they're sheared, they're dismembered. You could still find VMS, but I think your, your options are limited. And on the nickel front, uh, there's a plethora of very small uh, ultramafic intrusions scattered throughout the Grand James Bay, but there are no large systems which uh, you would favor in terms of finding a world-class nickel deposit. I think there are a lot of, uh, a lot of potential for small high-grade nickel deposits, such as Eagle, but uh, you know, is that gonna have a big impact in today's market? Uh, probably not. But uh, the lithium endowment is completely different. The geology in James Bay is just rife with uh, late tectonic uh, perluminous magmatism. Several large bathless plethora of pigmatites in, in many, many terrains, both the uh, metasedimentary pigmatites and also the tonalitic terrain. So I, I was, since we've been working this now for a year and a half, it's, it's astounding the, the volume of pigmatites that you can see outcropping in James Bay. Now in areas where you know there are a lot of pigmatites, such as the Montagne Belt, where Wabushi sits, where outcrop is relatively poor, the best technique, in my opinion, is, is uh, basal tail geochemistry. I don't believe in airborne geophysics uh, can adequately find uh, LCT pegmatites. They just, they're not magnetic, they're not particularly dense, they're not uh, conductive. Uh, geochemistry is by far the biggest, the biggest uh, sorry, the best technique that to find these hidden deposits. And the spot you mean, it seems, uh, can survive in the in a glacial environment a fair way so you should be able to any large deposit is going to generate a, a train of uh, lithium anomalies uh, from essentially mechanical dispersion of, of dysplasium now the, at this summer there's going to be thousands of boots in the field not just a couple dozen mm. from from Brunswick, uh, right. checking out the properties that they staked or acquired, doing what you did last year, and still have to do with a lot of the projects which you acquired when, you know, after the snow began to began to fly. But assay turnarounds for physical samples mm. have been horrific. Is there any it's hope months. that we might mm. not have to wait until summer of 2024 for results, field results taken during the summer of 2023, so that we might have drill programs ready to go, targets yeah. ready to drill by, by next winter? Yeah, the uh, the best technique I can recommend is, first of all, portable XRF uh, in the field on the outcrops to measure for pathfinder elements associated with uh, LCT pegmatite, such as uh, high rubinium. Next step, uh, if you do have, uh, just because you have a rubidium enriched uh, dike does not mean it's lithium enriched. It's the first step though towards uh, LCTs. So the next step would be to analyze your micas uh, for lithium content and to try to use the distribution of lithium in the micas in the pegmatite field to zero in towards the more fertile uh, bodies. And that can be done very quickly using uh, libs. Uh, <clears throat> and there are, there are portable libs now that you can buy for about 60 or 70 grand and have that uh, use it in the field or you can send it to a lab and get rapid turnaround. And uh, once you have the, uh, once you have the lithium signature in your micas, um, it's, I do not know of a single case of a spodumene deposit not having anomalous, at least uh, anomalous lithium in the micas. It's the first place lithium uh, concentrates before you even produce spodumene. So it's part of the evolution towards uh, Spodumene mineralized LCTs is, is first concentrating uh, lithium and mica. So those two basic 
uh, geochemical techniques uh, are very powerful and fast, cheap turnaround. That's, that's key towards uh, generating drill targets. Mm. And keep in mind when you're standing on an outcrop, uh, you might have an outcrop here, my outcrop over there, over there, and you're sitting on the margins of your pegmatite, you, you won't see the core zone where your typical uh, spodumene zone is, it might be hidden under moss. But I can guarantee you that every one of those outcrops is uh, going to have high rubidium in the feldspars and the micas and also high lithium in the micas. One final question. Uh, I can see half of the 700,000 tons or so the IEA thinks will be necessary for EV goals to be met by 2030 to be delivered by Australian pegmatites, to some degree Chinese pegmatites and brines, and to a significant degree uh, the, the lithium triangle brines on uh, sailors. Mm -hmm. And the other half I expect to come from places like Brazil and Canada. Mm -hmm. But the IEA points out that these horrific timelines to bring a new mine on you know, on stream 10 to 15, it almost makes this whole effort a waste of time because it's just not going to be available and the whole EV goal will simply fizzle and die and go away. Is there anything that can be done with the Canadian permitting cycle? You know, I expect two to three years to fully delineate everything that there is that deserves to be put in production. Mm -hmm. Is it possible in Canada to get this other half in production by 2030 so those goals become realistic? It's pretty difficult. Uh, Canada is already streamlined down to four or five years for the permitting process in most provinces. Uh, you have to do your environmental studies. You you know have to get your social license. Uh, you need IBAs with uh, Indigenous groups. It's, it's a time-consuming process. Uh, I think five-year timeline to get a permit uh, is actually quite good. It's a lot better than most countries. And it'd be difficult for the governments to attempt to streamline that even further. So are you talking about from the start of feasibility demonstration mm -hmm. studies to a permit, sure. as opposed to you have your feasibility study done and then you need to spend no, do, five years. You, no, no, you do oh, both in parallel. Part, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you, so you, you, you think it's entirely feasible that by 2030, all the work done over the next couple of years could have Canadian lithium supply coming yes. on stream? Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, because you always do your feasibility and your permitting in parallel and your environmental work. It's, you do it all in parallel. Okay. You only you can only file for your permits once you have feasibility, but you also have to have all the, the backroom work done. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's the standard method. I've been talking with Bob Wares of uh, Brunswick Exploration at the Metals Investor Forum in Toronto. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, John. It was a pleasure.